Hello, my, my name is Martin Lipscomb and I'm joined today by Dr. Patricia Benner. Uh, Dr. Benner gained her first degree in 1964 and since then she's practiced as a clinician, an academic and a theorist. And from 1982, Patricia has worked in research and teaching at the University of California at St. San Francisco School of Nursing. Uh, Patricia's biography and work are easily accessible online and therefore I won't detail her many accomplishments here. It's sufficient to say that her book from novice to expert, Excellence and Powering Clinical Nursing Practice, which was published in 1984, uh, must have been known, it, it must have been read by almost every nurse. Now, post that landmark publication, Patricia has continued to write, and today we discuss her contribution to the forthcoming Routledge Handbook of Philosophy and Nursing. And in this contribution, Patricia develops ideas initially examined in The Primacy of Caring, a book written with Judith Rubel in 1989. Now, in her new work, Patricia juxtaposes Cartesian rationalism, sometimes chided for being reductionist, a word that has for many people negative connotations, with or against forms of embodied knowledge that, in her view, better explain and give form to many, if not all, nursing actions. So, who was René Descartes? A mathematician, natural scientist, metaphysician, Descartes formulated a way of looking at the world that almost 400 years after his death in 1650 continues to influence many aspects of thinking today. Descartes' ideas, which uh, proved productive, were criticized from the beginning. Descartes distinguished between or separated immaterial minds and ideas from brains and other physical or material substances. Descartes brought into focus through methods of honed and rigorous doubt, methods that gave weight to understanding the cognitive or perceptive capacities of knowing, known as a conundrum that is generally referred to as the mind-body problem. Patricia, please, can you outline the argument contained in your chapter? In what ways do you think Cartesian ideas, uh, or perhaps what are thought of as Cartesian ideas, there's a lot of misunderstanding here, how might these ideas uh, misdirect attention? Well, I, the main focus I, I take in, in this critique is Descartes' view of the mind being um, representational, that that's the way perception and thinking occurs is through templates, um, theories, formal concepts. In other words, um, we uh, perceive the world through these various theoretical grids. And that is absolutely disproven by current neurocognitive science. But it's a folk psychology that we still um, imbibe in, uh, in our pedagogies, we're often thinking that students only understand what they have a formal concept for. They, um, the worst sort of consequence is when we consider practice is as mere doing. It's a, a, a rational calculation application of formal theory. And, um, we downplay it and devalue it. But practice is a way of knowing in its own right. And practice is sustainable without theory. And I'm, I'm a theory loving person and I, I want good theory for practice, but we're relatively new in the theory, formal theory business in nursing. And our practice is rich, deep, complex, and well-developed. Um, and um, what Albert Borgman points out is that um, uh, practice is actually sustainable without theory, but theory cannot do without the wellspring of knowledge embedded in, in a practice. So our sustainability and our um, enrichment and skilled know-how and expertise is really dependent on paying attention, giving good, better language to what we learn in practice. And <clears throat> I, I, later on, I will give you just a little snippet of an example of this kind of description, which is needed. And, and when educators work with students in the, in the clinical area, 
or even in the sim lab. I want them to be very busy thinking about the experiential learning and helping the student give language to the knowledge that they are gaining directly from practice. Okay. Um, I know you're very interested in the articulation of, of practice knowledge, something you've just been, I think, referring to. Um, why is it so important that a practice, a discipline such as nursing, has, a, has its own knowledge base? Well, you can't, um, you can't really do without your own knowledge base. And this, you know, your question really um, does push me to read this uh, first person experience near narrative directly from practice because it, can't, it makes it visible once. And <clears throat> so this is about a, a, a three or four month old infant who is, uh, on on the border of of uh, of coding, and so um, here's a just a little snippet of a first person uh, experience near account of knowledge and the Im knowledge embedded in practice. All the lights were out, and even in the dark, I could see that joy was a dusky blue. Okay, I stop here because. Uh, low blood sugar cause, causes a different shade of dusky blue, uh, as the nurse goes on later to talk about. And this child's blood, uh, blood sugar was 20 when this was going on. So look at this, how rich it is. Here's a qualitative distinction that we could do tons of research on and also have real clinical application of teaching nurses to recognize the dusky blue of low blood sugar as compared to cyanosis. Okay, stop with the digression. Her biox um, O2 sat wasn't picking up. I put one hand on her and knew why she, why she was ice cold peripherally. She was intubated, eyes closed, nasal flaring, restract, retracting, chest retracting, and I could hear her wheezing from the side of the bed. Centrally, she felt hot and that jogged by memory that she had a brain injury that caused her to have temperature instability as well. I could palpate a radial pulse, but I couldn't palpate a radial pulse, but found her brachial pulses easily. I thought to myself, at least she shouldn't be too hypotensive as well, but her cardiac output is definitely down. I quickly flicked Flip the vent 100% breath button and decided not to bag her, use a, a, a ventilating bag. Sometimes children, particularly heart babies with um, uh, BPD do worse uh, when you interrupt the circuit and attempt bagging. They're sensitive to volume and get out of sync and start to clamp down harder. So, She's talking about bronchopulmonary dysplasia, BPD. I'm sure Joy has a little of combination of both. I decided not to yell out to the night shift as mom was asleep on another cot at the foot of the bed. I hustled to the doorways and looked uh, at them all, all the staff. No one leave, she's about to code. I asked the secretary to page uh, respiratory therapy and tell her I needed her right away and turned the nursing station to Dr. B who is on the phone with cardiology. I looked at him and I said, I need you now. She looks like, and everybody responded. Well, this is a very, um, I mean, this is not unusual. I don't want you to think of this as unusual because when these critical situations occur, Rapid situational um, recognition is required, and and um, and so you you can really expose all of the knowledge or uncover all of the knowledge embedded in practice from um, paying attention to the first person experience near narrative. Um, so. <clears throat> 
Um, but most of our descriptions of practice are about knowing that and knowing about. They are decontextualized uh, and, and, and formal and they're essential but they're not sufficient to describe the layers of knowledge embedded in the expert skilled know-how of uh, a clinician like Emily Deaver in the situation. This narrative, by the way, is published in, in our book, um, Clinical Wisdom um, Interventions in Acute Critical Care. So you, you can find it, but there, that book is filled with such narratives in order to clarify the domains of knowledge in practice in order, and in order to uncover the knowledge that is there when you have um, uh, oh, so many areas of patients coping with illness, but also the kind of rapid situational awareness that's required for rapid clinical action. I mean, we could take an hour just unpacking the knowledge in this little excerpt. But I just want to give you an example of what I'm pointing to here. And this type of knowledge runs counter to, or it's in tension with, if I understand what you're saying correctly, ways of thinking which we tend to think of as Cartesian. Is that right? It does, because the Cartesian view doesn't allow for um, involvement, and perception and being immersed in the world and knowing directly from the world. It simply doesn't allow for that. <clears throat> okay. Um, now in your fully developed argument, you give a great deal of space to the idea of um, salience and in particular, the capacity of nurses to identify salience. Please, are you able to expand upon how this identification is to occur. And I ask this because if I've understood you correctly, salience references or it emerges from in part shared insights and shared ideas. Okay, but what about those occasions when insights and ideas are not shared? Can salience survive discord? No, no, a salience is irrelevant if, if you're in a situation where you don't share understandings. But of course, I'm describing, <coughs> excuse me, I'm describing a well-organized, deeply informed practice where there are shared meanings, such as if it's a cardiac arrest, get to it, to act. If it's a respiratory distress, get to it, act. Yeah, but we, Salience has another important meaning in the Dreyfus and Dreyfus model of skill acquisition, which I've researched extensively. At the proficient level, there's this wonderful qualitative leap where there is an experience-based sense of salience that develops. So I'm not talking about salience in general. I'm talking about it deeply embedded in a particular practice. And it's true for medicine and, and physical therapy and every other practice. So here at the proficient stage, instead of looking at the textbook for signs and symptoms, suddenly the nurse has um, a deep background experience with say pulmonary illness, a uh, pulmonary embolus. Maybe they've seen uh, six to 10 of them and they now can recognize it uh, um, as a whole syndrome, which is pretty complex and pretty ambiguous, but, um, and it's that switchover, it's, it's equally important in medicine, where you're using your perceptual grasp of whole concrete past clinical experiences, and suddenly, and this is what salience is, suddenly some things just stand out as more or less important without you having to figure it out or analyze it or break it down into a problem list. This is crucial for any practice discipline because all practice disciplines like the failed early art uh, artificial intelligence runs into what in philosophy we call the limits of formalism. You can't make explicit all the knowledge embedded in practice. 
um, Polanyi said famously, a clinician's all, clinician always knows more than they can say. Um, but this limits of formalism uh, is overcome by human experts in a way that the old fashioned information processing artificial intelligence could not overcome because of a sense of salience. They're not looking at the situation and having to build it up element by element by element. They're looking at the situation as deeply meaningful and they're looking at it through a lived history of having seen lots of patients with pulmonary embolus or uh, infants who weren't tolerating their patent ductus arteriosus. And of course you don't rush, I always have to tell the British empiricists this, of course you don't rush the child off to surgery immediately uh, once you have this recognition that this is, uh, you know, uh, that this child isn't tolerating the patent ductus arteriosus, but it is crucial for the early warning. And it's this early warning that usually, uh, if, it, if you're gonna save someone's life from sepsis, you need an early warning. If you're gonna save them from pulmonary edema, ed, ed, edema or embolus, or many, many emerging, emergency situations, you need the early warning before all of the explicit uh, vital signs show up. Uh, that are, are missed in the compensatory phases uh, that the body is um, fighting uh, against. So sense of salience is very, very important because you recognize from, uh, as the artificial intelligence workers like to say, the real world is the best model of the world. And with proficiency stage of skill acquisition and the gating of the sense of salience, there is a qualitative leap in the capacity for early warnings and responding quickly to rapidly changing clinical situations. Okay, and this, this type of knowledge, which I think you used the phrase embodied knowledge, you um, position in antagonism or intention with forms of knowing which some people would label Cartesian. Now in your in your development- Can I just clarify, yes. Martin? <clears throat> there is no unembodied thinking. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, uh, thinking, the mind is not separated from the body. Um, and the current neurocognitive sciences prove this, but it's all embodied and all situated in the world. And it usually comes out of a stance of involvement, which the Cartesian stance starts with uninvolvement, detachment, and disengagement. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, now you discuss in your in your work um, knowing without thinking, and to quote. Uh, from a draft of your chapter, you say, uh, when we in the Cartesian tradition imagine that learning and knowledge come only from existing mental images, ideas, and concepts, we too easily pass over uh, new knowledge and insights captured only in accounts of situated thinking in action, and the, the new learning we develop immersed in clinical experiences. Okay, however, Descartes attributed in a modern context, we've given prominence to the problem, what do we know and how can we know it? This is part of his legacy. Now, regarding learning that develops from experience, might this learning be accused of being ultimately uh, solipsistic? And I presume not. However, can experientially informed learning be articulated or convey to those who haven't had that experience? And if so, how? And I ask this because um, if such learning can be articulated and shared, are not Cartesian type ideas or ways of thinking about knowledge back in play? They aren't, um, but of course, um, they aren't simply because the, the real refutation is that our perception depends on representations in the mind. That's the crux of the issue. But um, let's go back to the example I gave. Um, the perception of a different shade of blue that looks different from cyanosis if you have extremely low blood sugar. 
that can be conveyed. And once you articulate it, it also can be increasingly noticed. Um, so it creates a, a consciousness raising. It falls under ontological knowing and not just epistemology because suddenly things are meaningful and they show up for you because someone said, oh, with this very low blood sugar, you get this dusky color of blue. <clears throat> yes, it's fuzzy recognition. Yes, it's ambiguous knowledge. And yes, you need to see the dusky color of blue in order to really know it. But you can't probably notice it until someone tells you to look for it. And so articulation is terribly important. Um, and the practice I think that embodies this the best are neonatologists. They took for years every neonate and said, this is an opportunity of learning. We've never seen a child this young before, and we've never seen a child with these conditions before. And they carefully and astutely learned from each premature infant. Consequently, the survival rate of low birth weight children has diminished over time. And it's been from this direct, uh, unrepeatable opportunity to observe and learn from each uh, neonate, premature neonate by neonatologists. It's a, it's a real shared practice for them. Okay. Um... Patricia, your chapter is very interesting, and I'm sure lots of people are going to really enjoy it when they get a chance to have a look at the whole thing. Um, thank you very much for your time today, and um, I very much hope that the seagulls who've been going bonkers outside the window uh, haven't interrupted too much on on the um, on the recording. Um, You're lucky to have seagulls outside your window. <laughs> I wish we had quieter ones. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank, thank you again, and I think the arguments you're making are interesting arguments that many people will find fascinating. So, I thanks. hope people don't under, I don't hear this as uh, antagonistic to theory. It, I am not antagonistic. I am just making a sort of strong claim for practice as a way of knowing in its own right and not just a mere rational application of already preformed knowledge. Hmm. Yes. Patricia, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you as always. I have, um, oh, okay, after, yep. the, after the interview, I have a question for you, All right. so. Okay, all right. Thank you, Patricia.